Hello, welcome to my talk, which is going to be about Enigma machines and functional programming using Elm. Um, my name is Ju. I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. I was born in China. I spent a lot of time in Italy, so I know everything about cooking pasta or making pizza. But I have been living for a while in the UK, so I guess just fish and chips now. Um, you can find me online as Arkham with a four. And I work for a company called No Red Ink, where we help kids become better writers. Um, and we do that using functional programming. So do check us out. We're you know, definitely hiring. Um, I'm going to start with a super, super, super short history of cryptography, just to make sure that we speak the sort of common language so that when we are going to take a look at the Enigma machine, we're going to understand much better why certain decisions were made. So, first of all, uh, cryptography, it comes from these two Greek words. The first one is cryptos, for hidden, and the second one is graphia, <clears throat> for writing. So, everything about cryptography is this art of writing secrets, right? So, imagine we have this secret message we want to send. We're going to encode it, so we're going to turn it from its plain version to its cipher, enciphered version, or its encoded version. Um, and at this point, the secret message is turned into this big mess, so nobody should be able to read it anymore, and we can send it through an insecure medium. So it could be a letter, it could be Morse code, it could be the internet. Uh, once the message reaches its intended destination, they can do the reverse process, which is to decode it, so that from the cipher text, we get back the plain text, and we can read what you know they sent us. Um, and during the history of humanity, this is something that people have been trying to do for you know thousands and thousands of years. And as a matter of fact, we know that Julius Caesar used a cipher to send messages to his generals. And to this day, there is a cipher called the Caesar cipher that is a very simple cipher and it works like this. You take a message, you break it by uh, characters and then you shift each character by three right um, so for example if we wanted to send at to brutus we would take e we would replace it with f g h and so on and so forth for every letter in the original message at this point we would write down this message send it through a courier and whoever received this message would have to know that we use this um, cipher they would do the reverse procedure to get back the original message. And at this point, we know that uh, this is a pretty, this is a cipher which is pretty easy to break, right? Because once you know that the trick is to shift a letter by an X amount of steps, then it becomes very easy to break. And as a matter of fact, you only have 26 different combinations. So of course, people uh, you know, have tried to be a bit smarter about that. And they've come up with this idea, which is called a monoalphabetic substitution cipher, which is basically you just choose a completely random mapping between letters and you just find a way to share this with whomever you want to communicate, right? So this is the shared secret that you and the other person have. Once you have this shared secret, then you can just take your message, use this lookup table to get the enciphered version and you send it, the other person has the same version of this um, lookup table. They just have to use it in the opposite direction to get back the original message. Um, and it seems to me that like this sort of mapping is quite e difficult to break, right? Because uh, there are so many different combinations. So it's not easy to just guess, uh, you know, which is the mapping that you've just used. Uh, but unfortunately, there are some problems with our current technique. Uh, the first problem is you can see the spaces. And if you know that the message is written in English, uh, there are not that many words with two, three, four, five letters. So you're giving away a lot of information by leaving those spaces. So what you can do is just remove them, right? Uh, you can just remove them. And from this point on, it's really difficult for someone who doesn't know the code to recognize you know um, the where a word is starting or where a word is ending so this is easily fixed but there's another problem which is much more difficult to fix 
Uh, this graph represents the frequency of letters in the Western alphabet in the complete works of William Shakespeare. So you, we can see that the most common letters which are used are E, A, T, I, O, right? Um, and this graph basically represents some sort of a fingerprint of the use of letters in the English written language. So if we think that we have this monoalphabetic substitution cipher, it doesn't really hide this sort of information, right? We could be mapping E to X, right? But if we see that in the ciphertext, X is the most common letter, we can pretty much guess, you know, which one was it, right? And once we guess what is E, we can move on to the next letter, do some sort of backtracking, and we can easily figure out what is the mapping. And this is something that has been known um, for people for a lot of time. There's letters written by Arab mathematicians in the 9th century that were describing this way of doing frequency analysis to break a monoalphabetic uh, substitution cipher. And the bad news is that there's not really a fix for this. Like this fingerprint is pretty much uh, something which is just what English is, right? And you can make another one for uh, Spanish, for Italian, for German. So every language has this sort of like fingerprint and there's nothing you can do to you know run away from that so clearly you know people have been busy they've come up with other ways to switch up this encryption uh, but for the sake of brevity i'm going to skip for fast forward for a thousand years um, and just start talking about the enigma machine uh, this is a real enigma machine i think this one was in bletchley park here in the UK, there's a museum where you can see, you know, original versions of these machines. And I think every once in a while, uh, a new one appears from some sort of basement and it sells for, you know, $50,000 or something like that. Uh, so this machine was created by this uh, German engineer um, and it started being used in the 1920s, uh, first of all, by some commercial companies. And then slowly it was adopted by the German um, armed forces. So the army, uh, the navy and the air force. Uh, and each one of these branches were using this machine in slightly different ways. They made some custom modifications. But at the end of the day, it was mostly the same sort of idea. Uh, it's a machine that is almost completely mechanical, but it has a battery. So the way that it works is that whenever you're pressing a key uh, on this keyboard, one of these letters is going to light up. And basically, let's say you press A and X lights up. It means that the A in the plain text corresponds to X in the cipher text. Uh, we're going to see later, you know, more in detail how the machine works. Uh, but I wanted to stress out that um, as opposed to what we said before, uh, the Enigma machine implements a polyalphabetic cipher. So it means multiple alphabets. And as a matter of fact, every time you press a key on that keyboard, the alphabet that's used to encipher the message changes. So every time you type A, it changes. You type another letter, it changes. And the reason why it changes is because of these rotors that we can see at the top of the machine. Um, so now we're going to, you know, uh, first of all, we're going to understand, you know, what are all these bits that compose the machine. So if we had some magical way to open the machine, we would do it. Ta -da. And this is what it looks under the hood, like once we remove that cover. So first of all, we can look at this plug board in front. This is a way for basically implementing a mono-alphabetic substitution cipher. So you can see there's these plugs and there are cables that you can use to connect two letters. So for example, we can connect Q with E. And this means that every time we type Q on the keyboard, actually the signal which is sent is E. And at the same time, uh, later we will see that uh, after the whole encryption mechanism, let's say the machine wanted to print uh, R and R was connected to Z, it would print Z instead. Well, it would light up Z, right? Um, so this plug board is something that is used to create a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. And as we said before, by itself, this wouldn't be secure. This would be easily br broken by frequency analysis. So 
uh, how does it work? We press the key, it goes through the plug board. Once it goes through the plug board, it goes all the way to the bottom of this machine and gets inside this first rotor. And this rotor, uh, you can see there's one here, there's two, and there's three. If we look in detail, uh, one of these rotors, we'll see that it's this big mess of cables, which means that whenever we get a signal that enters in one of these pins, it gets completely scrambled and it exits somewhere else, right? So if we try to follow the path, we go from here, we go through the plug board, we go to this first wheel, it gets scrambled, gets here, gets scrambled again, it gets to the third wheel, gets scrambled again in some sort of way, right? Uh, once it gets scrambled, it gets to this uh, little element, which is called uh, a reflector. And this reflector is sending the signal back. It's just like this curved cable, if you want to you know, have a mental image of it, which sends the signal back. It goes back inside into the third rotor, back to the middle rotor, back to the first rotor. At this point, it gets all the way down on the back again. It goes through the plug board again, and it goes through the light and you know that's what the battery is for it's just there to um, turn this light bulb on so every other component of this machine is purely mechanical there's no uh, you know motors or engines or nothing um, you know which is too smart the battery is just for the light bulbs um, so we were saying before, you know, this thing that whenever I press a button, these rotors are changing their configuration, right? So if we imagine uh, each rotor is like this big mass of cables, the moment where one of these rotors rotates, the alphabet that we use to encipher the next key has completely changed, right? So if there was only one rotor, there would be 26 different combinations, but we can see in this case, there's 26 by 26 by 26. And this already, by these three rotors, we have 17,000 combinations. Um, also, at some point, uh, they decided to introduce more rotors. So they had, uh, you know, uh, six rotors to choose from. So they had to choose three of the six rotors, choose them in the right, uh, you know, sequence. Uh, to that, you sum all the possible permutations which are added, but all the possible configurations um, of uh, the plug board. Um, and the number becomes really, really big. Uh, it's so big that even a modern computer can't really break Enigma just from a purely, uh, you know, computational sense. Uh, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, something which I struggle a bit when I first look at the Enigma machine is to actually understand how it works, right? So we know, and we said that, you know, we press the key in the keyboard, it goes through the plug board, goes through the wheel, middle wheel, left wheel, reflector, all the way back through the plug board and then turns on the lamp. But I felt it was difficult to understand how does it really work? Like we said, it's mechanical, right? That's fine, but um, you know, it doesn't help me much, right? Uh, luckily, I found this really, really good uh, YouTube video, which is called, How Did the Enigma Machine Work? Uh, and I'm going to open it in my browser because um, it's a bit nicer to look at. Um, Great. Um, so we can see that this is the machine um, and we're going to basically take it a little bit apart. And you can see that there's like this piece of metal at the bottom of the machine, which is called this actuator bar. And every key is connected to this bar. And you can see that whenever you press down on a key, uh, this uh, left hand side goes down. But due to this little you know, connection, the right hand side goes up. And to the right hand side, if we look towards the back, there's these little hands. And you can see there's one, two, three hands, one for each rotor, right? And you see that whenever we press a key, one of the rotor is basically constantly turning. And this is because basically this hand is just, you know, hitting the gear of the rotor. And at every key press, it turns the rotor by one position. So you can see this is how we turn the first wheel. And um, this is also called the fast rotor because it means that no matter what, that rotor is always uh, clicking, right? Um, but as we said before, this wouldn't be enough, right? It would be just 26 combinations. That's really low. So there must be a way to turn, all, to turn the other wheels as well. And you can see that normally 
uh, the second hand doesn't do anything. It hits against the smooth bit of the wheel and it's stopped from advancing anything at all. But the first wheel has this little notch which allows the hand to fall in only when it gets into a certain position. So you'll see that whenever that first wheel gets into that special position, it will allow the hand to fall in and it will push the first and the second wheel. Uh, the thing is, the first wheel was already pushed by the hand that now we can't see, but the first hand, right? So the first wheel was moving anyway. So actually, the only thing that changed is that we were able to push the second wheel or the middle wheel. And you'll see uh, now that happens. And once we push that wheel once, you'll see that the, the hand can't get into the notch anymore. So it basically, it just turned it once, right? And in this way, we ensure that we go through all the possible permutations of these three wheels. Um, something which is interesting at this point is to notice that even now the middle wheel has another notch, right? So before we said when uh, the second hand gets into the notch, we push the middle wheel, right? Um, now when the third hand gets into this notch, uh, there's something interesting that happens, which is a sort of, of a mechanical bug of the first versions of the Edigma machine is that when this hand falls into this notch, uh, we wanted to just push the last wheel, but due to how it's constructed, it's going to push the middle wheel as well. So you will see that when I that thing happens, all three wheels get pushed by one click. And this in, is called double stepping, and it's a mechanical bug because uh, due to this double stepping, we are actually reducing the key space because it's not 26 by 26 by 26 anymore, it's only 26 by 25 by 26. Um, and it's interesting because in later versions of the Enigma machine, they fixed this bug, so they removed the double stepping. Uh, but in the code which I've written, I've implemented because I think it's really neat. Um, okay, so I really recommend to watch the whole video. Uh, it's 20 minutes, but it's this amazing, you know, thing. I really, <laughs> I'm in awe on how beautiful the video is. So I really recommend watching the whole thing. Anyways, uh, let's go back to the talk. Um, I wanted to do a sort of tutorial on how to use uh, the Enigma machine. And I want to put myself in the shoes of the operator that in the Second World War would actually, you know, open the box and start using it. So first of all, they would receive a code sheet like this one. And we have some of these copies uh, either from, you know, like German archives or from spies that stole these code sheets. Or sometimes uh, there were these sort of called pinch operations where they would <coughs> sink uh, you know, a ship or a U-boat and they would be able to, you know, recover some of these code sheet before um, people were able to destroy them, right? Um, something quite fun is that in the top it says Geheime Commando Sachel, which means uh, secret command operation. <laughs> and you can see here it says uh, the date. So there's like a line for each date of the month. And for each day it says which are the rotors that we're supposed to use in this sequence. Uh, there's this thing called a ring setting. So you can imagine that each ring has a sort of clip that you can uh, sort of unpin, rotate the wheel and pin it again. And in this way, you basically make it so that you add 26 more combinations for each wheel. So this thing even you know augments the key space. And basically, uh, you know, like if we look at the first time, we said, okay, we want to use wheel 4, 5, 1. We need to set them as offset 21, 15, and 17. Then these are all the pair of letters that need to be connected with the cables on the plug board. And then there were some sort of like, uh, this Ken Gruppen is like this. Um, it was used for many different reasons. Sometimes it was used for making sure that people, you know, use the right line in the code sheet. And sometimes it was used for other reasons. Um, but basically this is what the operator, you know, had access to. So what they did uh, to every day to insert a message, to open the code book, pick the rotors with the right settings and set the plug board. And this was the configuration for every message for that day, right? 
Um, but the problem is that imagine we are able to somehow figure out which are the rotors, which are the settings, and which are the plug pro combination. At that point, um, if we are able to break that, it means we can read every message. So what they thought is that, oh no, instead we're going to create a temporary message key to encipher each message. So that if you are able to break that, you are only going to be able to break one of them, not all of them. Right? So they came up with this procedure, which is, first of all, you set the rotors positions randomly. So you just scroll them to some random numbers and you write down this initial random position. At that point, you come up with a temporary message key, usually made by three letters, and you type it uh, twice uh, inside the machine. And they decided to type it twice as a sort of error correction mechanism because they used to send this message through uh, Morse code and they thought that it was a good idea to add some error correction into the this ve like very important key code. And at that point, they would set the rotors to this temporary message key, encrypt the message, and send everything, right? Uh, and here we have one of such original messages. You can see that here, I think this is the random initial position. This is the six letter encoded message key. And the rest is the encrypted message. And you see, when you look at this like this, you can't understand at all what the message is about. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, like on the other side of you know the communication channel, um, once you received such message, you have a copy of the code sheet. So you open the code book, you set your machine uh, with the same rotors, you put the right you know settings on each rotors, you set the plug board, and at that point you read these uh, initial rotor positions. You use this initial rotor position to decipher the message key. Then you set this message key to the rotors and you're able to read the message. And this is how the German operators used to do every day, you know, every day. And for every message, they would choose like a random um, initial rotor positions, a temporary message and so on and so forth. So they would only keep the rotors and the plug board fixed for that certain day. Great. Uh, now it's time to talk a bit about Elm um, because it is a programming conference after all, isn't it? Um, so Elm is a functional language, it's mainly designed to build web applications. So I'm not going to talk too much about Elm, you can go and check it out, the website is elmlang.org. Um, but I just want to say a few words. So first of all, it's a statically typed language, which means that uh, usually when you write a function, you also write some types that describe what you are going to pass to the function, what you expect the function to return. Uh, it's a pure language, so in normal functions you can't do um, side effects. Actually, like in all functions, you can't do side effects, but there is a way to perform side effects which is managed by the Elm runtime. Uh, and at the end of the day, this language compiles to JavaScript, so you know, in, you are going to have an HTML file, it's going to include this JavaScript, it's going to run you know, whenever the page is loaded. And at the end, I think it's quite fun. Um, so yeah, let's look at the code, shall we? Um, great. I have this repository with all this code and I think I want to start with a couple of files. So first of all, I said there's, um, uh, index HTML, right? So if I do SRC index HTML, we can see it's an HTML file and includes this, uh, Elm file, which is great. Um, but something I wanted to show real quick is, first of all, the Enigma machine, right? Uh, we were saying about the journey of a letter. And I think what is quite nice about this type of problem uh, is that it's a perfect match for uh, fu functional programming, right? Uh, because if I look at the function, which is encode, this function pretty much describes exactly what, uh, you know, the graph that we've seen before, the diagram that we saw before does. Right, so um, something which maybe we need to emphasize again is like the first thing that we do when we want to encode a character is that we m step the Enigma machine. So anytime you press uh, a key in the keyboard, the hand pushes the rotor up, right? Or many rotors up. So we're going to call this function to move the Enigma machine in the next configuration. And then we're going to take the thing that we pressed, we're going to swap it through the plug board. Uh, we're going to pass it to the right rotor, to the middle rotor, to the left rotor, uh, through the reflector, backwards to the left rotor, middle rotor, right rotor, and back into the plug board. 
right? So this is exactly what we described before in plain English. Um, and the other function that I want to take a look at is, is this step function that takes an Enigma machine and returns a new Enigma machine. And basically it checks if either the middle rotor or the right rotor are at that notch, that you know, little hole. So um, the one that allowed you know, all the other wheels to be pushed. So if none of them is at the notch, we will do the last case, which is only turn the right rotor, which is the fast rotor. Right. Um, if instead the right rotor is at the notch, we know that we need to push not only the right rotor, but also the middle rotor. And then this is uh, what we described before. So if we are at the notch of the middle rotor, uh, due to the double stepping, we're pushing the left rotor. The right rotor is always moving, but we are also pushing the middle rotor. So this is what caused you know, that um, reduction in key space, like this middle rotor is pushed in more than one condition. Um, and this is all, like I have like a little bit of an encoding code, but this is basically the whole module, you know, this is the Enigma machine, there's not much else to it. Um, if we want to look at the rotor uh, themselves, um, there's this Wikipedia page that lists uh, all the mappings of these original uh, rotors. So basically, we know that rotor one, the mapping was this one, right? So I just wrote this down. So I wrote, oh, this is rotor one, this is rotor two, rotor three, rotor four. And later, they introduced more rotors, as I said. Uh, but one fun fact is that uh, they also decided to add more notches to the latest rotors. And actually this uh, was a mistake because creating these rotors with two notches actually helped the Polish and the British crypto analysts to distinguish whenever it was that they used one of these rotors or whenever they used these rotors from, um, you know, that only had one notch because basically this thing would make it so that the following wheels would turn more often and you could sort of observe that into the ciphertext. So with this attempt of being more secure than end up being less secure, which I think um, you know, is a good lesson uh, in general. Um, and something else that I want to show is the plug board. Um, it's basically just a dict that points from a character to a character and yeah, there's not much to it. Basically, whenever uh, you're saying, okay, I want to map A with B, I insert both A to B and B to A. And that's pretty much it. Um, so maybe now it's a good time to actually show you the machine in action. Ta-da, here's the machine. Um, and you can see that you can type an input and this is the generated ciphertext. Uh, and you can choose a rotor, uh, you know, many rotors, you can, choose you know the setting of each rotor and you can also choose the starting position of the rotors um, something which i want to uh, clarify is that i've decided for this uh, drop down to always show the starting position so that once you choose the starting position you can change the rotors but you would not lose that information right um, but i just wanted to show that i also want to show what is that the actual enigma machine would show so for example you can see that if the initial position is ddc here we show ddc but the moment i type a letter you see this thing advance to d and so on and you see the more i type at some point is going to hit the notch of that uh, rotor and it's going to advance the second wheel as well and so on and so forth, right? You can see like this thing is just basically keeping going. It's like clicking like the actual Enigma machine would. Um, and this is also like the beauty of this polyalphabetic substitution cipher. You can see the input is like a list of A's, but the output is a big mess, right? Um, you will notice though that of this big mess, there's one letter which never appears in the ciphertext, which is A. And this is because due to the nature of the Enigma machine, uh, the same letter can never encode to itself. And uh, this was a consequence of the fact that we use that little reflector in the machine, which basically means that there's no encoding and decoding process. You know, the encoding and the decoding process are exactly the same. But the consequence of that is that um, due to the way they designed it, a letter can never map to itself. 
and uh, whoever tried to broke to break this machine uh, used this information uh, as a hint because imagine if we want to send we know that uh, there is um, a station which is a weather station so they're always going to send a message every morning at six with the weather report right so they're going to write weather report right um if we type W E A T H R. You'll be able to see that none of these letters match with the um, ciphertext, and that tells us it's a very good guess that this could be weather, right? If we bump into any letter that's matching, we know that you know that it's basically not the right plain text. But the moment where we find a letter which none of the letters match, then we got something that could be a potential match. So actually, during the war, uh, a lot of you know crypto analysts had these big sheets of paper, and they were just scrolling letter by letter beneath uh, the ciphertext to try to find what they call cribs, which were these you know possible guesses of possible plain texts um, inside this ciphertext. Um, great. Um, I still have a little bit of time, so I wanted to show you also like a little bit of niceties of Elm. So for example, here I wrote uh, a little parser that it's parsing uh, what you write inside the plugboard so that, for example, you can't leave a letter hanging uh, and it will just tell something. But also, let's say here we're mapping E with F. So if I try to connect G with F, uh, the parser will notice that and will tell, no, you can't do that, right? And the same thing, for example, if you try to map um, a letter to itself, right? Uh, like physically, you cannot just connect the same cable to the same letter. So the parser, you know, does a little bit of work there to figure that out. Um, and, oh, and th the last thing is uh, the main file um, where I just want to show maybe like this so we can uh, better understand what's going on. Uh, we have a model which basically stores all this UI information. So, you know, the setting, the position of each rotor, which are the plugboard inputs. I store these validation errors that we talked about. Um, and then, um, you know, every time we do something, so we change, you know, one of the settings, we receive a message. And this message goes through a function which is called the update function which gets this message and reacts to it. So for example, whenever we change a rotor, we're going to change our Enigma machine to you know, uh, use this other rotor and then reparse the whole input from scratch to generate a new ciphertext. Um, and this is basically like the reactive nature of an Elm application. And then the last component is this view function, which basically takes the model and generates um, this HTML page. And in this case, I've used um, Tailwind CSS to add a little bit of style into the page. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's nothing too exciting about this Elm application. Um, so one last thing which I'd like to do is to do oh, this I'm called here. So I would like to try it out, right? So I would like to pretend to be um, a German operator. We know that today is the 11th, right? And we know that these are the rotors that we're supposed to be used. And these are the settings. These are the plugboard settings. And we're just going to try to send a message and then receive it, right? Um, so let me just open my terminal again. Um, I have it into, I think it's talk talk great um, and I just I'm just gonna look 11th perfect so here I'm going to open the machine I'm going to empty it out the input and we know we want rotors um, five uh, one and three and the settings are going to be 17 uh, 13 and four. And at this point, uh, I can just choose, I can just copy the plugboard setting. There we go. And at this point, we need to choose that initial random position, right? And for fun, I'm just going to choose Elm as the random initial position. Uh, once we have this initial position, we know that we need to encode in the message key. We're going to choose MIC, and we're going to type it twice for you know this error correcting mechanism. And we're going to write it down. So we know it's GPS SCT. And we knew that initial random position was EL, right? 
And at this point, we can send our message. Uh, this is uh, quite a, a... So I need to set the position to this MIC. And I can just paste this message. So if you speak German, this means uh, nothing to report. And this was one of the actual cribs that um, crypto analysts used because they used to target these remote outposts where nothing was happening during the war. So they were pretty much sure that nothing was happening and therefore their message would be nothing to report. Uh, and I thought it was quite fun. <laughs> Um, anyways, so uh, you see that once we do everything and we set up the machine this way, this is the message that we get. So I'm just going to save this. So basically, this is what they would send uh, via Morse code. Uh, whoever received this message, uh, they would see, okay, the initial random position is Elm. So let me just empty this out again. Uh, the initial position is Elm. So I'm going to set it like this. Um, they you know, chose all the rotors, all the settings in the right way. And now they knew that the six letters that were describing the message key were these six. They would type in, they would say, oh, MIC, MIC. So now they knew that the setting was M, I, C, right? At this point, they would key in the encrypted message, copy it back, and you can see keine besonderen Ereignisse, uh, which is nothing to report. And yeah, so that's great. Um, I've done all this. Uh, so I've created uh, this list of really amazing material. Uh, there's this YouTube video that I was mentioning, which I really you know want you all to go and watch. It's 20 minutes, but it's like you know the best spent 20 minutes of your life probably. And then there's a lot of other resources, there's some other much better implementations than mine, which show you the exact path of um, you know the letter through the machine, uh, with, um, you know it's really much nicer than my version, um, and then some more websites which describe the Enigma machine. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my talk. Uh, I'm just going to end with a few things. So you can find a plain version of this Enigma machine here. You can see both the code and the materials of this talk uh, at this um, address. And you know, if you want to help the current dark situation which is happening, I really recommend donating. Um, that's the best thing we can do, you know, as tech people uh, to help out. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around. Um, I have a lot more, uh, you know, information and resources about how they broke the Enigma machine, which are the weaknesses both in the machine and the procedure that people used. So if you're interested in that, please do come and, uh, you know, um, talk to me um, after, you know, I'll be, you know, very, very happy to chat about that. Um, so yeah, thank you.